Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia and we are here to sketch another insect today. Um, I am looking at a stag beetle under the microscope and I was just chatting with Susan a little bit in the chat. It sounds like we're into stag beetles, which is really exciting. She had mentioned that it could be thorax gear, which I laughed about a little bit. Um, Thorax, uh, thoracic ear is a lot of times seen on scarab beetles, like Hercules beetles or rhinoceros beetles, where you're going to have the horn coming off of the pronotum or the thorax, rather than having it actually be the jaws, like on a stag beetle here, over there. <laughs> um, so, we are looking at a stag beetle today. This stag beetle was collected in one of, um, one of my secret awesome places to collect, which is uh, Mount Carmel Junction in Utah. It's uh, very, very southern Utah, and every time I've been there, there have been awesome bugs, and it's a very small kind of, I wouldn't even consider it a city. It's kind of like, there's a gas station and a hotel and maybe a restaurant right there, but all of the lights are really bright and they bring insects in from a huge, uh, huge distance away. So every time I've gone, it's been um, epic with insects, so that's a lot of fun. So this is actually in a, a stag beetle that was collected in Utah. Um, if we throw it underneath my desk camera here, we are going to be able to go ahead and measure it. This is a male stag beetle because you can see that it has these ridiculously large mandibles. And the females have significantly shorter mandibles. So, going from the front of the mandibles all the way to the back of the abdomen, let's see... It's probably 3.1 or 3.2 centimeters if it was all kind of straightened out. The abdomen is falling just a little bit on this specimen, so it's angled a little bit down, which is why it may have looked shorter to you guys than it looks to me. That's the inches side. Yeah. Uh, either 3.1 or 3.2 centimeters for the length of this specimen. I am going to go ahead and just write that in the, um, I'm going to write 3.15 centimeters uh, long in the uh, chat so that if somebody else was curious about it, they'll be able to find that information. And I recently learned that I could pin that message so that everyone sees it at the top, which is fantastic. So, we are looking at this stag beetle, and admittedly, I'm not exactly sure what species this is, uh, but I do know the family, because all stag beetles, let's go ahead and write it here, all stag beetles are in the family Lucanidae, spelled like this, L-U-C-A-N-I-D-A-E. Um, and there's a couple characteristics of stag beetles that we can see every single time we're looking at them. Um, one, a tarsal formula that we'll see as we're sketching it. And the second one is the antennal psych. As the antennal types, all stag beetles or leucanids have 10 antennal segments. Um, and a lot of times they're going to have a club at the end that is pectinate, meaning that it's almost like a comb, and uh, you can't see the antenna on this specimen until we actually flip it upside down, so we're going to be doing that too. <coughs> Alright, but it's awesome that we uh, can actually sketch this beetle from a dorsal or a top point of view. Um, uh, keep in mind that we are... Oh man, welcome back, Deb. I'm so excited to see you here. I'm so sorry you were sick, but I'm glad you got to travel. I uh, I hope you were having a great time. Um, we're going to be starting our sketches really light, just as we always do. Um, our, mac our microscope is zoomed out all the way, so we can determine the... Oops, it moved. 
So, we can determine the uh, length of the mandibles in comparison to the head, which should be kind of cool. Uh, the length of the mandibles from the base of the mandibles all the way up to the tip is about 0.42 centimeters, and then the length of the head is about 0.53, so the head is just a little bit longer than the mandibles here. Perfect. So when I'm going to go ahead and start our, uh, our sketch of our stag beetle here, keep in mind this first sketch is going to be really, really light and loose. It's not going to be anything that's too heavy handed because we're going to be coming back and zooming in and fixing all of our lines here. So instead of uh, copying all of these jagged lines along the edges of the head, we're just essentially going to create two parentheses, kind of like so. And our goal is to create a head that isn't so big that we're going to go off the paper. Here we go. Something like that. Um, so we've got two parentheses on the left and the right. And I'm just going to uh, complete it with a top line and a bottom line. And now, admittedly, we are going to be zooming in and fixing some of these lines as we go. Yeah, that's better. All right, so if... We know that the uh, mandibles are going to be a little bit shorter than the head. So keep that in mind while you're adding your mandibles on. They're going to be very, very light, and they're not going to reach all the way to the edge of the head here. There is a, they come in just a itty bitty bit. Something like this. Now, you may be seeing, let's see, I'm going to fix that just a little bit. Uh, you may be seeing the uh, labial palps. So you see those little segmented guys on the inside of the mandibles? Sometimes we call those mouth fingers, right? Because they're little segmented and they help push that food into the mouth. Um, stag beetles like this male here, um... Stag beetles like this male here aren't really going to be using those mandibles to eat. They're more going to be using them to fight off other males. Um, but they do have those little itty bitty mouth fingers to kind of push food into their mouths. And they use those to, and they do kind of eat like rotting wood. We call it detritus, kind of dead and dying plant material. Let's move on to the pronotum. All right, so uh, a couple of things that I noticed right off the bat with the pronotum is that really pretty um, top arch there on the top of the pronotum, and also those really awesome golden hairs. Now, uh, this segment here is the first segment of the thorax, so um, it's also where the first pair of legs are connected. You can see, actually, Terry is already pointing at the first pair of legs right about here. So... Um, if I come here to my head, my pronotum goes out a little bit wider than the head, right around here, and then we come down with two parentheses. It looks like the, uh, the pronotum is just a little bit longer than the head, so I'm going to take that into consideration when I'm giving our, my, ourselves a light sketch of the pronotum. Keep in mind that we're going to be fixing a lot of these lines when we come back and zoom in. We're just getting some uh, graphite on the paper so that we have something to work with. So that is going to be our approximate size for the pronotum. You can see that is just a little bit longer than the head, and the head is just a little bit longer than the mandibles. So I'm happy with all of that so far. Let's scooch our specimen. We're going to have to also angle it just a little bit because this body is uh, tilted a little bit. So it's a little bit tricky to get it all at the same angle. Now, if you notice all of those little dots along the outside of the elytra, those are punctations, right? So whenever you see in a beetle or other insects where they have almost they look like little puncture wounds like if you could take a needle and just poke the exoskeleton over and over and over again with little itty bitty dots those are punctations 
Now, um, I don't have the ability to show the entire elytra or that entire area underneath the microscope, but what I can do is flip it over here um, underneath our camera and kind of look at it and see what we can see. So the abdomen, um, this next region here, it is, um, it is the next two segments of the thorax and the abdomen. So you can't say that this whole thing is the abdomen, but what you can say is that it's covered by the elytra, right? Those wing shells. So I would say you're about a little bit longer than the body that we've already added. So if you take your mandibles and your head and your pronotum, and you kind of measure those out on your paper and then give yourself a little bit more distance, that is going to be maybe about half of the length of the mandibles. Let's see. Yeah. That's going to be the approximate length of your elytra or those first pair of wings here. <coughs> All right. So something that you may notice as we're first getting started is that where those elytra start, um, there's this little bit of a waist here. So if we come along, it looks like this waist is about the diameter of the inside of the mandibles. So if you come to the inside of your mandibles and you come all the way down to the end of the pronotum, that's about as wide as we're going to get. And then we can come out and make it nice and wide after that, kind of angle this out. Um, the edges of our elytra, or these wings, are almost 90 degrees here. Alright, we're doing something. This is good. Very good. So, we've got something happening here. Now, the other thing that you'll notice is the scutellum. That's that little triangle in between the front pair of wings, right? And so right here, it starts up here almost touching the pronotum, and then it's going to come down and meet, not very pointed, it's going to meet at a rounded space, and that is going to be the center or uh, where your elytra or your wings meet. I'm going to make... I made my uh, my waist region here just a little bit wider. That's fine. All right. What I want, maybe it needs to be less wide. There's something not right with this so far. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the specimen and I am going to check him out like this. Very good. All right. So I think where I, we need to do is make this waist just a little bit wider and then a little bit less narrow more narrow. Ah, that's going to be better. All right, now we have the total width of our elytra already labeled out, so now all we have to do is kind of round it out here. It's going to start fairly uh, perpendicular with one another, and then once you get closer to the end, it comes out and rounds down. It's going to be a little bit longer than I had originally marked, but that's okay. Our goal right now is just to get graphite on the paper. Give us an idea of what our specimen is going to look like. I hope that you, Deb and Susan, have had a good bugging week this week. Um, have you seen any interesting insects? Oh, you know what? I saw a really awesome rove beetle recently. That was, that was very cool. There's a part of me that really wants the elytra to be longer. That's better. I'm happier with that. Alright, so we have a very, very rough beginning of our stag beetle here. Um, now we can go ahead and zoom in and check out some of the features. Uh, keep in mind that when we 
do you draw legs? I'm probably just going to draw the one set of legs. I'm going to draw the side on the right side, I believe. Um, but that'll be fine. Let's go ahead and zoom in on the head. See what happens. A flying ant! You know what? The flying ants are out. In fact, I went bug hunting about... When was that? It was this weekend, possibly Sunday or Monday. I went bug hunting, and I found two queen ants. So, um, the flying ants are out in number, and because it's the beginning of the spring, you're going to find a good number of queen ants. Bugs under a telescope, Thomas. Welcome. Um, this is a microscope, mister. Telescopes can see far, far away things. This sees stuff super duper close up. Now, I can see the compound eyes on this beetle, but it might be a little tricky for you to see the compound eyes on this beetle because they are so very similar in color to the exoskeleton on the head. All right. Oh, where'd my screen go? Give me a minute. It's gone. There it is. Okay. It moved. That's what happened. All right. So, um, now we're all zoomed in at the head and the, uh, and the mandibles of our stag beetle here. And what I'm noticing now that we're zoomed in is there are a couple of features. Uh, the front of the head is not all the way straight like we had originally sketched it. It does, from this corner, um, angle down. But then once you get to the end of the mandible... I need a new pencil. Give me a minute. That pencil has failed me. All right. Very good. Much better. All right. So we're going to start at the corner here. And then we're going to angle it down just a bit. Once we get to the edge of this mandible here, we're actually going to come up. This is equivalent to what you might call... The clippius? Maybe it's the labrum. It's kind of like the upper lip of our mouth part here, where right after the mandible, we come up and we have this little bit of a hill. And you can even see the little hairs in the very, very center of the mouth. So we're going to go ahead and give it like an M shape here within the inside of the mandibles and then angle it down towards the outside. So there we go. We have some of the definition on the top of the head here. Now what I want to do is add the rest of the head before I zoom up and go to the mandibles. So we are here at the corner and we're going to come out and in. But what I want to show you, what I want to show you is right here. Where's Terry? There's Terry. Okay. Um, Right around here, this is where the compound eye is on the right. And right around here, this is where the compound eye is on the left. There is an angle of the head that comes in just a little bit. But you also have a piece of exoskeleton that comes down and kind of is like a ledge over top of the compound eye. So that one is going to be just an itty bit tricky to sketch. So what we're going to do is we're going to come here to this corner that we've made. We're going to go out, angle outside of where we expected just a little bit. And then um, from here, we're going to actually come in inside of the head and then out just a little bit. We're going to meet the bottom. So that gives us a space where we can add the compound eye. And now we're going to do it on the other side. We're going to give ourselves an edge. And then we're going to come on in. And we're going to go inside of that angle for the head. Uh, give ourselves an edge. And then come on in. So that is going to give us an 
outline of the head. I'm reading E.O. Wilson's memoir, so a flying ant would be apropos. I love it. Yeah, see, the um, I have not read much of E.O. Wilson's memoir, but it's definitely on the list of things to sketch. Admittedly, I'm still in the process of trying to finish Ant Hill, which I've been really enjoying, but I um, just haven't had as much time to read as I wanted to. All right, so now we have the space for the eyes, but we still have one additional little piece of exoskeleton that we have to add that comes here from the inside and points down, kind of like this, on both sides. And now that we have these two additional spaces, we can add those compound eyes, and they're going to wrap just like this all the way around the head. And you know me, I really like to add cross-hatching within those compound eyes. So um, diagonal lines in one direction and diagonal lines in another direction will give you all of the little itty-bitty um, omatidia, or the little itty-bitty eyes within the compound eyes. Very good. All right, so I haven't finished the bottom of the head here, but I do want to go up and look at the mandibles a little bit. Why not? We did do, we did sketch a queen ant together last year, and that was a whole lot of fun. And I remember, um, I'm not sure if it was with you, ladies and gentlemen. Oh no, what happened? Sorry, my screen decided to switch over to the, uh, I don't know, another page. Um, I'm not sure if it was with you that I realized it was a queen ant, but it was with a class that I was teaching that I had put the ant underneath a microscope, and I looked at its thorax and realized that it had wing scars. Um, I'm not sure if it was with you or with uh, an actual, like, student class, but it blew my mind. I was like, oh my goodness, guys, like, this ant was actually a queen, and I never knew. I couldn't give you the date or anything, so you're going to have to look it up. All right, so you can see those li that little orange kind of tuft of hairs, that little, like, mustache doodad in between the thorax. So I'm just going to go ahead and go doop, 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 and give ourselves a little mustache on the front of our mandible, on the front of our head here. That was with you, Susan. Oh, man, that's awesome. That makes me so happy. All right, so it looks like the left side mandible is on top of the right side, and admittedly I did it backwards here. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the left side first. It has a really beautiful curvature here, so we're going to start on the inside, and we're going to give it that really nice curve coming in. And the left-hand mandible is going to be the mandible on the top. But it, it looks almost like they're stacked rather than meeting exactly in the center. And there aren't very many dentations or there aren't very many teeth on these mandibles here. And then I'm just going to take the right hand side and I thought I was going to have them meet a little further. But um, my mandibles want it to look like that and I'm okay with that. So we've got these mandibles that are curving towards the center. Now you'll notice those little itty bitty doodads. Those are going to be those are maxillary palps, not labial palps. Maxillary palps are going to be closer to the mandibles. The labial palps are going to be on the bottom jaw. So if we flip this beetle over, you'll probably see the labial palps. Um, but what you can see from the maxillary pulps here are two segments. So that's what we're going to add. We're going to go one, two on the inside, and then we're going to go do two on the other side. One, two, and those are definitely maxillary pulps, or what we love to call mouth fingers, that can push their food into their mouths. 
You know, I was out, I'm not sure if I told you guys this already, I was out hiking last weekend and I found two queen ants. We'll see if I can, uh, we'll see if they, uh, they, they do well. I love the punctations on this pronotum. It looks so speckled and dotted. It makes me very happy. All right, so we have that head taken care of. Now, when we're looking at the pronotum, keep in mind there's this really beautiful kind of like M arch here. So we have it originally just kind of arching down, but now we know that these corners are not as pointed. They're not as sharp. This is why we keep the handy dandy eraser around. Um, we're going to come, and it's not super, it's not a lot wider than the head either. So we're going to come over here, and we're going to give it just a little bit of an arch here and a little bit of an arch there. That's going to give us kind of our edges. But now, we want to make sure that the highest part of the point is on that lateral line, because insects are symmetrical. So we're going to come down and then up, and then down and then up. And as long as that arch is very similar on the left and the right hand side, I'm happy with it. Uh, the My right side looks a little bit lower, so I'm going to raise it up just a little bit. And then we've got it all taken care of. The edges of our pronotum here are not super smooth, but um, so we're going to try and make them just a little bit ragged, but... Admittedly, I'm okay with them being a little smooth. And we're probably going to be narrowing the elytra too. That's probably what was going on, why it felt so weird. So let's see. We've got the, this guy taken care of. And if you look at the bottom of the pronotum, it does kind of narrow out a little bit. And it gives you these little bit of a corners. And the very bottom is pretty straight. It arches up just a little bit, just a skosh. And then I'm going to go back in and erase any of my sketch lines that I no longer need. Alright, so that's where we are so far. We have the head. We have the pronotum. All right. Now, we didn't add some of these hairs. So they do have these really beautiful golden hairs in between the head and the pronotum. They also have those same really pretty golden hairs between the pronotum and the elytra. I'm just erasing this top part here because I've noticed that my elytra are just too wide. I want them significantly more narrow, so I've erased them so that I can reevaluate things. Alright, so we are looking at these down here. These are the elytra, or those first pair of wings of beetles. And this little triangular doodad here, that's the scutellum. They exist in between the front pair of wings. Now, we talk mostly about the scutellum when we're looking at beetles, but flies and bees also have them. And true bugs. Dragonflies don't. I don't think praying mantids do either. Mostly just beetles, flies, wasps, and true bugs. Anyway, um, we're going to give ourselves this, uh, this waist now. And I think that earlier my waist was just a little bit too narrow. So I'm going to be coming in more like this. Probably on the outside of the mandibles rather than on the inside of the mandibles. And then our elytra come out and angle just a little bit past the edge of the pronotum. Not a whole lot. And as long as your left side and your right side are symmetrical, your stag beetle will be happy. Now, something that you, as we've been sketching, you may have noticed that we totally skipped the antenna of this beetle. 
The antenna are tucked underneath the head, so we're going to have to flip it over to see the antenna. But they're really cool antenna, so we will be sketching them. All right. Um, right hereabouts in the center, I'm going to go ahead, let's see. What I want to do is take where the shoulder is on both sides and give myself a really pretty kind of arched line down from shoulder to shoulder. And then right here in the center, we have this scutellum that comes down to that point, but then after that point, it pretty much narrows and points off. And then above this region, here and here, you can drop a little bit of graphite and then just kind of smudge it in. It's just a little bit of a darker region because it's kind of going away from the camera. All right, so from here, we're going to be adding the edges of our elytra, and these are mostly symmetrical until you get to the very end. I think, let's go ahead and pull the specimen over really quick. All right, I think I'm pretty happy with the length of my elytra here. So what I'm going to be doing is taking this guy and I'm going to be going mostly parallel on both the right and the left. Probably about three quarters of the way down before you start angling towards one another. And this is going to meet in the center at a point, sort of like that. And then you can erase any and all of those sketch lines around your wings, around your edges, because you don't need those anymore. And if your eraser kind of darkens anything that too dark, you can come back in and add some and add some paper, pencil here. And right here along the center, we do have one very solid line because this is in between the wings. And that is going to give us our head. Our thorax is this segment and then two more into here. So the thorax is probably this region and then the abdomen here. All right, now I believe let's do the front legs because we can see those from the top and then we will do the antenna because all the rest of the legs we're going to have to flip upside down to see, I believe. Oh, no. Sorry guys, I keep uh, pushing a button or something when I look at my microscope. I'm going to have to figure out what button I'm pushing. So we are looking at the forelegs. This is the front pair of legs of our stag beetle. Keep in mind that all beetles have very similar bones, like a leg structure as human bones. So your first bone between your hip and your knee is your femur, and then your big bone between your knee and your ankle is your tibia. It's the same thing with beetles. This right here is actually the first bone or the first piece between the hip and what you might consider a knee. This is the femur, although when you're looking at it from the top, it only looks like this. It looks really short, but that's because it started way here in the inside. Now then the next segment here is the one that has all these awesome spines. This is the tibia. The smooth side is on the inside, so that's the side that's a little easier to do. And it looks like it comes up to about midway on the eye here. So I'm just going to give ourselves one really nice line to about midway. Um, and I'm going to come down a little bit because that also uh, takes into consideration this spine. And then when we come out, you'll notice that the end of the tibia is just a little bit wider than the base of the tibia. So we've got two spines here, and then it comes flat, and then we have two more. One, two, and then it comes and kind of narrows. So that's what we're going to have for mostly our, our tibia. And then we have tarsal segments. Now, tarsal segments are the toe segments, and in leucanids, 
they have a 5 5 5 tarsal formula, meaning that they have five tarsal segments on the first leg, five tarsal segments on the middle leg, and five tarsal segments on the hind leg. Um, and this beetle, for our first four segments, they're very rectangular, and then the last one is what I love to call the raindrop shape. So let's go ahead and sketch it. We've got one, two, three, four, all right, and then we have one more that's nice and long. We call this the raindrop shape because it's narrow at the base and roundy at the end. And then we have two claws afterwards, one, two. And admittedly, I do believe there's a little hair in between the tarsals, in the, between the tarsal claws. We can go ahead and add that. Now, keep in mind that you guys are sketching while I'm doing all the talking too. So, you probably have time to do both sets of legs. I just don't have that kind of time while I'm chatting with you. So, we're going to flip it over. I see the labial palps. The question is, will you see the labial palps? The, uh, the microscope might be a little bit too dark. Okay, you can kind of see them from here. So these are the palps that you could see from our dorsal point of view. Those are the maxillary palps. And if you look right here along the bottom, it looks like there's these two little stubby guys, one right here and then one right here. Those are the labial palps, and they're, they almost look like they're one-segmented off of the bottom jaw to kind of help push food into this mouth here. But what I really want to do is zoom out and then look at the antenna, because honestly, stag beetle antenna are really awesome. We're just going to look at one. I want it to be more in focus, but it doesn't look like it's going to be too in focus. So I'm going to have to also explain to you what I'm seeing because I can see it all right. And I hope that you will be able to see it too eventually once we get there. All right. So the antenna are connected actually up here in front of the eyes. And all Lucanids, all tiger or all stag beetles have... Um, 10 antennal segments. Alright, so they are, some of them are geniculate or um, elbow shaped, and some of them are more straight or non-geniculate. Um, but this one does have a very, very long first antennal segment. So right around here, it's nice and long and rectangular, coming up from the front of our head, and it goes whoop. There we go. All right, so that's our first antennal segment. It's nice and long. Now, I believe there are five segments here. Let me check under my microscope really quick. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. No, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Okay, so there are five smaller, almost circular segments here after the long one. So we've got from here, which was, it's the first segment considered the scape. We have one, two, three, four, five. And those are pretty tiny and they're all circular. But if you count all of the segments so far, you have six. And then we need four more. And this beetle has a four-segmented club. But the club is not just any club. This club is what we call pectinate. Now, uh, pectinate, we're going to call it a four-segmented pectinate club. Um, pectinate just means that it looks like a comb. It's like half of a moth antenna. So, um, it also looks like if this beetle was holding it out in front of his head, the club would go away. So, 
from here, we're going to be adding a four segmented club, but it's going to be wide. So it's going to be something like one, two, three. And then the last segment is circular, four. So that is going to give us our 10 antennal segments. This first one that's nice and long. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six are small. And then seven, eight, nine, ten are part of the club. So that is our 10 antennal segments. And then we have a five, five, five tarsal formula, which means our middle and our hind legs should also have five tarsi. Let's check it out. So from this point of view, because we're looking at it from the bottom, you can actually see where the legs are connected to the bottom of the thorax. But you can also imagine that because the femur is kind of short or stubby, you can't really see much of it when you're looking at it from a top point of view. Do the antenna have hairs? Great question. Let's go look. on the antenna. It's possible that there are a couple. We are zoomed in right now to the club, but when you zoom in so far, it's really difficult to get enough light to the camera if you're zoomed in too far. So there are hairs on the bottom of the head and the bottom of the pronotum, but when you're actually looking at the antenna, which is right here, I'm not seeing any hairs. Now you ladies and gentlemen know that we very, very regularly, very, very rarely see the uh, segment in between the coxa or the hip bone and the femur, right? That's called the trochanter, but you can see it right here. It's this little kind of wide triangle. It's shaped a little bit like this. It's pointed at the top and kind of rounded at the bottom. Um, it, it essentially acts as kind of a knee in between the hip and the femur. Um, but we can't, we aren't going to be drawing that from a dorsal point of view, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. The uh, middle leg uh, is going to be coming up at an angle with its femur right around here. And if you were to take that back, the femur connects right around here for the middle leg and then right around here for the hind leg. So we've got that femur taken care of and now we can sketch our tibia. The inside is mostly round except for that end spine here. And then you have the two at the very end and then it looks like three coming up. So just make sure you've got those spines about right. They, uh, they grow each time you have one. So the first one should be pretty minuscule. And then you have two and three that are a little bit heavier. And when you get to the end, you've got to the end of the tibia, but you still have to add the five tarsal segments. And they're going to be the same as the first pair of legs. So uh, one, two, three, four, and then the raindrop shape for five and then the two claws. 
And I do believe that the middle leg also has that little hair. He's pretty awesome so far. Now he only has to need now all he needs is a hind leg. I have lied to you ladies and gentlemen the middle and the hind legs are more separated than I thought the middle leg is more connected down in this region it's about a half an inch lower than I expected so um, if you imagine the hind leg connected way down here and then it reaching out your hind femur is only going to be coming out right around here which is Honestly, the second half of the elytra, but there is a huge space in between the middle and the hind legs. Uh, then we can add our tibia, which is once again smooth on the outside, but has this, I believe the hind leg has two barbs and then a spine. And then our tarsal segments do look just a little bit longer on the hind leg than all of the other legs. Something like that. Alright, so we had noticed the punctations, and admittedly, I kind of want to add some of those, so I'm going to come in and add some of those dots on the elytra and on the pronotum. But we have been able to talk about distinguishing features of our, um, of our stag beetle. So one of which being a 10 segmented um, pectinate antenna. Many of them do have the, um, the, that almost geniculate look where they have um, that first segment's really long and they look like they've got like an elbow there. Um, but some of them are more straight, but they are all going to have 10 antennal segments, and they're all going to have some type of club. Now, the females are trickier to identify because the females don't have these huge mandibles. So when you're looking for a stag beetle, a lot of times you think, oh man, I just have to find a beetle with some really awesome mandibles. But um, sometimes you'll skip the females because you didn't realize they were actually stag beetles. Funny stuff. Now, I know that I almost did this on fast forward. I feel like I talked really fast today. But um, I am feeling really good about our beautiful stag beetle sketch. It looks a little bit like this. We got to talk about their bodies, and we got to see their head, and the tops, and the bottoms, and the legs. Do we have any questions about um, stag beetles? This was great! I love that, Susan. Thank you so much. Um, so. Uh, keep in mind that I will be in California uh, next week. What? All right, so April 27th, next Thursday, I will not be live streaming because I have to pack and prepare to fly to California to meet a bunch of you. All right. Did we discuss what they eat? That's a great question. I don't believe that we did. They like to chew on rotting wood. All right, so they're going to be, well, and then some of them eat sugar, like they drink sugar water. All right, so the grubs are going to spend their time in rotting wood. They're going to be chewing on the uh, trees that have fallen. Um, but then once they're adults, I don't believe they're actually eating the rotten wood. Once they're adults, they are traveling to either flowers or fruiting bodies and finding themselves yummy, nice sugar water. But when are you coming to Albany? I will be coming to Albany, Susan, I promise. Um, I need to figure that out on 
my calendar, I have the uh, the plan for April being California, and in July I'll be in Arizona. So maybe sometime in May? My birthday is in May. Maybe I can make it a birthday trip. That could be fun. Um, Albany is honestly not too far away from me, so I think that I can make a road trip out there. It's funny that because stag beetles in captivity, they're just going to be eating beetle jelly. But when they're in, when they're out in the wild, I believe the adults really focus on like sugary plant juices. So whether that be like sap from trees or nectar from flowers. I'm going to double check that really quick. Yeah. Stag beetles may also drink from soft fallen fruit. Yeah. So the larvae eat rotting logs, but the adults prefer to just find themselves yummy sugar water. Because they said, I'm done with those logs, now I want candy. <gasps> Susan, you have Carter Blues? Oh, man. And do you have a backyard that I can blacklight in? That's the question. Can I blacklight there in Albany? All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, I just want to say thank you for hanging out with me today and for sketching the stag beetle together. If you have any additional questions, always feel free to let me know. Reach out to me. My email is trisha at theinsectopia.com. I actually recently identified a oil beetle for Hashi. She hasn't really been here at the live stream much, but she, um, she does stay in contact with me via email. And you can, too. Go ahead and share your sketch with me. Um, let me know what you, uh, what you learned from our live streams or some of your um, favorite things that we've talked about or favorite things that you learned. I kind of love it. Um, I also teach on OutSchool. That's way up there. That's for students ages 5 to 8, 9 to 12, and now 13 to 17 because I have college prep entomology classes that I'm teaching to advanced insect learners. Um, that has been a whole lot of fun with the students that I have. Um, and I now have students in Korea and Australia. So, um, so out school has been a blast. And if you know somebody who loves bugs and wants to also meet other bug lovers, it's a great place to start. Um, keep in mind, please subscribe to my channel. And once you've subscribed, you can chat in the chat box, which is awesome. Um, down here on the bottom right corner, you can see that there's a QR code there. If you've enjoyed what you've learned today, if you would like to uh, support me, um, if you'd like to support me, uh, you can feel free to drop a to drop a, a, a donation in the PayPal account. That is completely up to you, and I love when it happens. Um, yep. That's all. And um, over there is just a little picture of a bald-faced hornet. It's just to remind me to say, hey, um, I also have a Facebook and an Instagram that I like to post pictures on. Uh, my Facebook is mostly about, I know I just became really blurry, and I don't know what's happening. My, uh, here, maybe that'll do something. My computer is working really, really hard to figure it out. Okay, there we go. Um, so at Insectopia 2015 is where I am, um, on Facebook and Instagram because Insectopia was already taken, but you can always come and follow me and check out the pictures I post or, uh, learn about the other things that I teach to the younger students. Like today I teach two classes before I live stream with you and we talked about sulfur butterflies and the fact, and we talked a little bit about puddling and we talked about nectar guides and how butterflies see differently than people do. And we got to meet my rose hair tarantula with the older kids. And we got to talk about all the different body parts and the difference between old and new world tarantulas. So if you know a loved one or a little one in your life that would
would be interested in learning all that type of stuff, feel free to reach out to me. Um, thank you so much for hanging out with me for the hour. I'm going to make sure I put my labels back on this specimen here. And I forgot to tell you what year it was collected in. This specimen was collected on July 28th of 2010. So this specimen is now 13 years old and it's still happy and has all of its pieces. I'm always proud of that when that happens. So have a wonderful rest of your week. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that I'm going to be taking Sundays off for a little bit just because... It's been so pretty in the Philadelphia region, and I want to go collecting bugs, especially because I need more bugs to show you guys. So I'm likely going to be taking a couple of the next handful of Sundays off. Did I give the length? Yes. Um, 3.15 centimeters long. And I not only gave the length, but I commented the length, and I pinned it to the top of the chat. All right, any other questions before I go? No problem. All right, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week. I will not see you next week, and I want to take Sundays off. And then I'm going to be in California. So the next time I will see you will be May 4th. May the 4th be with you. Um, I will see you on Star Wars Day. That is when I will see you next time. Have a wonderful next couple of weeks. And uh, stay buggy.